Today we're going to be talking about the methods of interpretation. There are three, there are five different methods we're going to be talking about tonight on methods of scriptural interpretation. And remember that Keep it in the back of your mind that the focus of the basic objective of this interpretation is discovering the meaning intended by the author when he wrote it. If you keep that in the back of your mind, it'll be a great, great thing. If you keep that in the back of your mind, what was the intent of the author? And if you keep that there, you, you can be pretty safe in what you're doing because um, as we get into this, you'll see there's different interpretation methods that people use. And the reason why we have so many denominations sometimes is because of these typical um, methods that are being used. <clears throat> so the first one we're going to talk about tonight, praise God, is the allegorical method. You heard me mention a few, a little bit about that, and about the uh, uh, allegorical method and how dangerous that can be. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about three different aspects of each of the uh, different uh, methods. I'm going to give you the origin, the definition, and the evaluation. And uh, as we get into this, you'll see that um, there's one that's going to be uh, conclusive to your um, preference of what you prefer. And um, I think we'll all come to the same conclusion. Amen? Praise the Lord. So the allegorical method, what is the origin of that? Anybody know the origin of the um, allegorical method? Well, actually, it came and it originated through the union of Greek philosophy and religion. That's where it all started. It's, um, there was other allegorical methods that were used, but not to the depth that you, you see here, because the uh, Greeks needed to be able to um, rectify their religious with their philosophical. And so the only way they could do that is come up with a new method of interpreting it because it would actually contradict, okay, their religion. So you'll see that a lot of cults do that. A lot of the cults will allegorize scripture so that they can fit it into their doctrinal uh, beliefs. Or they'll, they'll add things to the word of God or they'll subtract things from the word of God. And they'll, um, they'll ch actually change the word of God. And it can be changed by just one simple word. Um, all you have to do is add one simple word or take one simple word away, and it can actually change the entire meaning of the Scripture. I'll give you one quick example before we get into the allegorical method tonight. One way is the way the Jehovah Witnesses uh, add the, the little simple letter A to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, which means that he wasn't, God Almighty, but he was a God. And they say, well, that's in the original manuscripts. Trust, I can, I can tell you right now, it is not in the original manuscripts. I have the original manuscript from the King James Version, and it's not there. So if people that know, don't know that, they, and they tell you that, they're an expert in uh, Greek, you know, they, they've studied Greek, and they'll tell you it's in the original. All, all you have to do is ask them a simple question. What Greek text was used? To interpret the King James Bible, I asked I asked one of the elders that, and they, their their mouth dropped, you know, fell open because they didn't think I was going to ask that question. And I asked him, I said, "What text is the King James Bible written from? The Greek text, because you're using the King James Bible along with your Bible. So tell me what was the you studied the text, right?" She said, "Yeah." I said, "Well, what is it?" She said, "I don't know." I said, well, it's hard for me to believe you if you can, can't even tell me what text you were using in the interpreting and telling me that it's, not, it's in the original Greek, but it's not in, it's not in the King James Bible. So, um, and you can only use, you can take one word and just change the whole entire meaning. There's a big meaning between God, Jesus being God in the beginning, and versus he is a, a God in the beginning. Another, another such example is found in Ephesians, where it says, God who is in all and in you all in the King James. But in the NIV and a lot of the uh, newer translations, it says God who is, in, who is all and in all. They take the word you out. 
So when they take the word you out, and this is, this is very important because this is part of interpreting this Bible. When you take the word you out, a Buddhist, a Mohammedan, any other religion can read that and say, see, even your Bible says that God is in all. New Age, they can say, see, the Bible says God is in all. But in, in the right context, in Ephesians, who Paul is talking to the Corinthian, I mean, talking to the Ephesian church, right? He says, God who is all and in you all, meaning the believer. See the difference? So you have to be very, very careful with some of the translations there. So we're going to get back into the allegorical method of interpreting. Because philosophy was so great in, in Greek, in the Greek um, culture, their religion was contrary to their philosophy. So they had to come up with that way of interpreting things so that their religion could be founded. So what they did was, because of their loyalty to their philosophy, they had to conclude in order to reconcile the two that their religious writings meant something other than what they literally said. The method they created to do this was allegorism. So in other words, they made it so that it would, well, you know, when you read something, it's not really, it's not really saying that. How many times have you heard people say that about the Bible? That's not what it really says. And when you get into that kind of arena, you're into a big, big discussion and fight. Because the Bible says what it says and means what it says, and we have to know what it says. Amen? So the definition is the allegorical method presumes that beneath the plain and obvious sense of Scripture lies its true meaning. That's the whole premise of the allegorical method. They say, what you read on the surface is not what it really means. There's, some, there's a hidden meaning. There's something deeper. All of your major cults say exactly that. There's a deeper meaning to that. And then they give their interpretation. They give their input into it. And therefore, you know, before you know it, you've got the Jim Joneses and you've got the David Koresh's and you've got all the, the cults that are saying that the scripture says this and it doesn't say that at all. In the allegorization, a passage with obvious literal meaning is interpreted using a point of point by point comparison, which also brings out the hidden spiritual meaning not evident in the plain language of the passage. So to give you an example of this, uh, there's a theologian by the name of Tan. He cites Pope Gregory the Great's interpretation of the book of Job. And it says that the patriarch's three friends in Job denote the heretics. His seven sons are 12 apostles. His 7,000 sheep are God's faithful people. And the 3,000 humpback camels are the depraved Gentiles. Okay. But, you know, we laugh at that. But you want to understand something? We sometimes, if we're not careful, we can put our own meaning into Scripture. We can say it means one thing, and it really actually means something else. So let's evaluate that. Centuries have proven that the allegorical method of, is quite inadequate in the interpretation of Scripture. The error of this method begins at its foundational assumption that God said in plain language, is not really what he meant. So if there's a hidden meaning and there's another interpretation, always keep this question in the back of your mind. Then if that's true, you know what, you know what I mean? You talk to some people and say, well, that's not what the scripture means to me. Okay? So you talk to them and you ask them, okay, so what does it mean to you? And they give you some off-the-wall interpretation. You have to say, how do we judge that in accordance to finding out if that's really God or not. It's very, very difficult to judge the subjective. Because they're going to tell you, well, that's how I feel. Okay, well, that's how you feel, but is that... But what, we have to test it. We have to test the Spirit to see if it's of God. We have to test the truth. But where are we going to find the truth to your interpretation that you feel inside? And they don't have an answer for that. 
The only answer we have is this. It has to line up with this. It has to be interpreted. Your, your inner, your inner um, enlightenment, if you want, or revelation or illumination, whatever that has to be, has to line up with what is the objective word of God. Always remember that the objective word is what is really important. I'll give you an example. If someone comes to you and says, you know, um, i got to talk to pastor because I'm leaving the church and, I'm, and, and the Holy Spirit is telling me to leave. And, uh, well, where are you going? Well, I'm going to join Jehovah's Witness. I really believe the Holy Spirit wants me to join the Jehovah's Witness. Now, some Christians would say, oh, well, God bless you. Okay, you know, it doesn't matter. We're all the same. You know, we all worship the same God. That's some mentality. But that's not true. Here's my question. They're saying the Holy Spirit is leading them. So how do we test it? Come on, give me some answers. How do we test it? Come on, yell it out, scream it out. The Word. Okay, well, what Word do we use? Jesus said that He'll give you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will what? Lead and guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit will never lead you into error. Never. He'll lead you into all truth. So you know that that person is just going by their emotions and their feelings and not according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's why sometimes I get in a lot of trouble because I answer questions with a question. And people get annoyed at me with that. They say, why do you ask, ask a question with a question? I say, because I'm only following the example that Jesus did. He did the same thing because what happens is when I'm answering a question sometimes with a question, you'll come up with the answer. And then you can't blame me for the answer. <laughs> Amen? Praise the Lord. This method of interpretation, the allegorical method, is very dangerous, but there's no scriptural boundaries to guide its interpretation or its implementation. Through the allegorical method, scripture is interpreted apart from its grammatical, historical meaning. We're going to get into the literal method, and that will explain the grammatical, historical interpretation of Scripture. God, when he spoke to the, uh, the apostles, those that were used by God to write the Bible, he didn't speak to them in Moss Code. He didn't speak to them... Um, in some language they didn't understand. He spoke to them in words, nouns, adjectives, verbs, prepositions, adverbs, sentences, paragraphs. He, he used the written word, the, the time of their time, whatever language that was, Greek or Hebrew, whatever it was. He used the language of their time, but he used words. It wasn't just some something that they just wrote down. There was, a, there was a systematic way that God does things. Because God does things decently and in, and in order. And when he speaks, he doesn't speak out of his head. He doesn't speak crazy things. He doesn't speak one minute he's over here, next minute he's over there, and then you can't follow what he's talking about. No. He speaks in clarity. He speaks in words. And he uses... The, uh, Adverbs and nouns and pronouns and such and such and such. So how we have to understand those things. Sometimes we have to understand the tense of a verb. We have to understand the mood it was written. We have to understand the different things in the Greek. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to do that. Okay? I mean, you can read it, but you, if, you, if you have a question, then you can go a little bit deeper. That's why you have the Strong's Concordance. That's why you have Vine's Expository Dictionary. And there are other things that you can get a lexical, uh, an English-Greek lexical that can, you can follow along in the Greek and the English, and it'll tell you the words. That, I mean, there's so many helps on the computer that you can use that can help you get deeper. Uh, again, uh, 
talking about the fourfold ministry. If you don't know Granville Sharp's rule of of, in, of Greek, that about two nouns being connected with an ad, with an adjective. I mean, with a with a conjunction, and one with the definite article, the other one without the definite article. It's a further description of the first noun. You're saying, Pastor, what are you talking about? Yeah. But see, if you don't know that, when you read um, in the uh, Ephesians about put on the armor of God, right? How many times have you heard it spoken? Get up every morning, put the armor of God on, right? Right? You've heard it on television, right? Make sure you've got the armor of God on all the time. Well, in the Greek, that word put is the, um, is the aorist tense, not the, the present imperative. The present imperative tense would have given you a command to continuously, repeatedly do it. But the aorist tense is a command to do something once and for all. Put it on. Keep it on. Okay? So, not knowing that, you just have put on the armor of God. Okay, I'm going to get up in the morning, I'm going to put the armor of God on, I'm going to put the shield, you know, I'm going to put it all on. No. So my question is, is what is it doing off in the first place? Well, I went to bed. <laughs> okay, it's an invisible armor. <laughs> okay, but it has an implication. Okay. You put on the armor, keep it on, so you're not vulnerable to the enemy's attack. So that's just some, some other things there. Sometimes, by exalting the interpreter's intentions and ignoring the author's intended meaning, the allegorical method fails to reach the basic goal of interpretation and must be discarded. Also, extreme typology borders on allegorization. You know, you know well, Moses was a type of, you know, uh, this one was a type of, you can use types, but not to build doctrine. You can use it in a very, very guarded way. I'll put it that way. Okay, But always remember the intended meaning of what the author wrote is the actual meaning. And the application of that, we can apply it into our lives in methods. The second uh, method of interpretation we're going to talk about tonight is the, the mystical method. This is the mystical. Uh, we ran into that in Israel. There's Jews that were, uh, I forgot what they were called, Kabbalah, I think it was. They, they were into Kabbalah, if I'm remembering pro proper. And uh, they're the ones that, they, they're mystics. You know, they have this real weirdness, and we felt very uncomfortable with one of them that was there. He was talking some stuff that was way out there. Okay? Just because they're Jewish doesn't mean they're right. Just because they're Jewish doesn't mean they have a proper interpretation. But they were, they were way, way out there. And uh, we were like, we don't know why they scheduled him to come in and talk, but okay, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll sit down and think about this. But it comes from the, the mystical method of interpretation. The origin of the uh, mystical method can be traced to uh, the Haggadic method of exegesis developed by the Palestinian Jews in the Inner Testament period between the two Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. So they came out with a mystical method of interpreting things. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> and the definition is the, meth the mystical method presumes the hidden beneath the surface of the words in their plain sense, there lies a multiplicity of meaning. Well, if that's the case, how do we know what God really said then? If I said to you, I'm going to the store, that's a plain, simple statement. I'm going to the store. But if you think there's some other hidden method, you know, uh, hidden messages under there, oh, I see, you're going to the store so that you can go there to meet someone. No, I'm going to the store. <laughs> okay. But you see how you can interject things? It, no, no, it, you're going there, and when you go there, uh, something spiritual is going to happen to you. You're going to go by the bananas, and the bananas are going to talk to you. You think I'm, people, some people are weird like that. Okay. Those are crazy stuff, okay? 
Those are crazy things. If I give you another example of the mystical interpretation, in Exodus 20.13, it says, Thou shalt not kill. But in applying the threefold verses uh, sense of Scripture to this commandment, he says that it is natural sense is that murder, hatred, and revenge are forbidden. Its spiritual sense is that to act the, the devil and destroy a man's soul is forbidden, and its heavenly sense is that of the, for the angels hating the Lord and his word is, is, is as murder. So they're adding all kinds of things. This simply says, thou shalt not kill. Now, person will read that and say, okay, then that makes me a conscientious objector. That, in other words, if the military calls me to be drafted, I'm not going because I'm not killing anybody. Because the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Is that what it means? Huh? No. When God says, thou shalt not kill, that's to premeditate and kill somebody. But if you're in an act of war, God told the, the Israelites, go into the village, kill the women, children, husbands, wives, brothers, just kill them all. So God said that. It's in the Bible, right? That was literal. That wasn't figurative. That wasn't mystical. That, wasn't, that was literal. Go in the village, kill them all. So would he be violating his own commandment? No. Is it a contradiction? God's telling us to do one thing and he does another? No, not at all. So it's got to be premeditated murder, okay? Uh, whether it be jealousy or through, a, through a, you know, robbing somebody or, or just, uh, just downright jealousy, whatever it may be, to go out and kill somebody for no intended purpose. Some people just go out and kill people. But the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. That's what it means. It has nothing to do with serving in the military and going to war and killing somebody because you're not premeditating that. You're going there as a defense for the country. If the Israels did that, there would be no Israel today. Are you hearing me? If the Israel did not go out and fight and kill, guess what? There'd be no Israel. Okay. So the conclusion... To the second method of mystical um, interpretation is instead of regarding the scripture as a sensible communication from God, mystics turn it into a riddle, make it say almost anything other than what God meant for it to say, differing from the allegor allegorizers who tend to follow some comparison spiritual, uh, spiritualizes and they are more erratic not bound by any law of interpretation. There are laws in interpretation you and I have to follow. And that's how you can tell if someone's going off the deep end. If they're, if they're just trying to spiritualize everything. I gave you an example, I think maybe last week or the week before, how this woman, this is a true story in church, okay? because the pastor was telling me, he had a woman come for, to, to talk with him and said, Pastor, the Lord spoke to me, I think it's, uh, I don't know if it was in Proverbs or where, where the scripture was, but uh, he told me to divorce my husband because he's going to give me a new husband. And so the pastor said, really? What scripture did he give you? And the scripture was, he takes away the first to establish the second. Okay. Now, does the scripture say he takes away the first to establish the second? Yes, it does. What was her interpretation? She spiritualized that to make it mean what she wanted it to mean and put God's approval on that interpretation, which it had nothing to do with taking her husband and divorcing her husband to go marry another man. It had everything to do with the two covenants that God was establishing. He takes away the first to establish the second. It's got to be in the New Testament. So, again, but people can make the Word of God say anything they want to make it say, just like the Constitution today. Okay, the the, the Constitution of the United States was written at a time, and it means what it says, and it says what it means. 
what's happening today is we got liberal judges that are inputting their belief of what they want the, uh, the Constitution of the United States to say. And so they're saying se separation of church and state. That, that's nowhere in the Constitution. Nowhere. It's a misinterpreting of what actually happened. And so um, that's interesting. We won't get into that, but go look it up. Okay. So a lot of the things that they're trying to do is they're trying to change the interpretation of something by implementing their own beliefs into what was said versus taking it for what it actually says. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wow. Can't believe the time. By exalting the interpreter's intentions and ignoring the author's intended meaning, the mystical method fails to reach the basic goal of interpretation and must be discarded. Throw it away. It's not a good, it's not dependable, it's not reliable. The third one we have is the devotional method. It's how we read the Bible and we have our devotions. The devotional method. And so the origin of that, like the mystical, the devotional method of interpretation, originated with the Haggatic exegesis of the intertestamental period before the old, in, between the Old Testament and the New Testament was, was brought, and seeking to apply Scripture to their lives. And the Jewish scribes began to interpret them as in the light of their own life situations. So it became uh, a personal interpretation based upon their life situation. Now, we can, we, can, we can use that devotional interpretation method as long as we understand and know the grammatical historical interpretation of what the author meant when he wrote it. Okay? So in other words, You're going through a real battle. You're going through a real difficulty. Something's going on in your life. And you say, God, I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know what's going to happen in my life. God, I need a word from you. I, I, I can't look. I, I, I can't find my way. Where should, where, where should, what should I do? Where should I look? And all of a sudden, you turn the radio on, and there's a preacher on, and he goes, and I'm going to preach from Psalm 121 tonight. And the first scripture is, I will look to the hills from which cometh forth my help. My help cometh in the name of the Lord. You can take that scripture and apply it to your situation. Okay? Was he talking about, uh, was the psalmist talking about his own condition, his own situation? Yes. But we can take that and we can apply it to our own life. Okay? And say, Lord. You spoke that scripture to me as you was with the psalmist and whatever he was going through. You can't say, well, what I'm going through is exactly that the psalmist went through because you don't know. It's not written there what he went through in depth. But you can apply it. You can say, Lord, I, okay, you're giving me direction. You're telling me to look up to you. So, God, I'm going to look to you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to look, go up, look up to the hills from which cometh forth my help. My help comes from the Lord. Okay. Now, you're not taking that in a literal sense. If you took it in a literal sense, you'd have to get on a plane, go over to Israel, go out into the hills, okay, where this, where this particular scripture was written, okay, and look up into the hills. Okay? No. But you can take it to a, apply it to your life. The definition is that the devotional uh, method believes that the Bible was written for a personal edification of every believer in that it is personalized, hidden meaning can only be revealed by the shining of a great inner spiritual light. 1 John 2.20 is often a proof text for that. So let's read that, 1 John 2.20. Remember what I said about your, um, about this particular type of um, 
method of interpretation. Devotional is, you can use it, but it can become very dangerous because then you begin to rely upon your experiences to interpret the scripture rather than the literal method of interpretation that the author intended. You've got to be very careful. Can we have that first, John 2.20? Oh, that's not on. So that wasn't on for your song? Oh, that wasn't on for the song. So you knew him by heart? Sort of, kind of? <laughs> you were ad-libbing, huh? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, I'll just look over here. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Okay. To take this in its literal sense, in the literal interpretation of this, is it saying that you know everything? You don't have the Mr. Know-it-all spirit. Well, the Bible says, see, you know all things. Do you know all things? No, you don't. If you knew all things, you wouldn't need the unction of the Holy Ghost. Right? Can you uh, center that? That's not centered. You have an unction from the Holy One. Hello. You have an unction from the Holy One. He's the one that's giving you the unction. He's the one that's giving you the meaning. Okay? And you know all things. No. You're not going to know everything. We only know in part. We prophesy in part. We don't have all knowledge. If we had all knowledge, then we'd be God. We don't have all knowledge. So in the evaluating the devotional method, time has proven the devotional method to be quite dangerous as a system of interpretation in itself. For one reason only, the chief danger of this method is that seeking to apply Scripture personally, the interpreter may ignore the plain literal sense of what God was saying. And what I said? takes away the first to establish the second. If you take it personally and change the intent, the original intent, to, the original intended meaning of it, the devotional method has to be thrown out. Well, he's going to take my husband away so I can get a divorce and marry somebody else. That's what God said in his word. He's taking away the first to establish the second. She took it as personal, a personal interpreting word from God, but it changed the original meaning. So it can't be God. Everyone got that? Okay, good. So we don't rule out altogether the devotional practice and the edifying use of Scripture. We can use it as it is applied to our lives practically, but we always got to keep in back of our minds that it cannot change the literal meaning as the intended writer meant it. As long as you keep that, you'll be fine. The fourth one is the rationalistic method. And the origin of that, having its seeds in ancient history, the rationalistic method started to be developed during the post-Reformation period and is still bearing fruit in the modern age. Through recent centuries, the seed of rationalism has been in Germany where the schools of higher criticism have attempted to undermine the authority of Scripture. There are actually many different methods that are being summed up under this title because of their common characteristics. What's the definition of that? The rationalistic method presumes that the Bible is not the authoritative inspired word of God. It interprets Scripture as human document in the light of human reason. With the, ra with the rationalist, nature is the standard and reason is the guide. If the Bible can be made to harmonize with the knowledge of the interpreter, then it is to be understood as meaning what it says. But if not, it is to be regarded as mythical or used in the way of accommodation. I'll give an example. To a rationalist, Jonah and the whale never happened. It's a myth. 
It's a myth that a man can be swallowed by a whale, and then that whale would spit him up on the ground. It's, it's not rational. It doesn't make sense. He'd be drowning in the whale. He, he would be suffocating in the whale. He would die. It doesn't make sense that he could live in the belly of a whale for three days, three nights. So that, because of rationalistic thinking, that's impossible, can't happen, because it, they're taking it in a, in a rationalistic way, they nullify the Word of God. They don't believe it. So therefore, it's not, it's not authoritative. How do we know that Jonah and the whale was true? Huh? Huh? Yes. Good girl. It's mentioned in the New Testament by Jesus. He said, as Jonah was in the whale, belly's whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the earth three days and three nights. So if it wasn't true, if it was just a myth, Jesus would have never referred to it. Scripture interprets Scripture. As examples of rationalistic interpretation, to explain away the supernatural, Lazarus is said to have gone into a coma rather than having died. Oh, he wasn't really dead. He went into a coma. At some point he was still breathing, but you know, he, he didn't die, like really die, die. So is the rationalistic method a good method of interpreting? No. Because it nullifies the truth of God's word. The Bible says that Lazarus was dead four days. He didn't say he was in a coma. He said he was dead for four days. And, he, and even when they wanted to take the stone away, right? His sister, was it Martha or Mary, whichever one it was, says, Lord, if you're going to remove the stone, you know, it's been four days, he stinks. Those are proofs that he was dead. But to the rationalistic mind, he wasn't dead, he was in a coma. Or when Jesus appeared to have walked on the water to undermine the authority and the veracity of Scripture, Historical evidence such as crossing the Red Sea and the transfiguration of Christ are explained either as fanciful exaggerations or contrived myths. How can a person walk on water? It's the gravitational pull. The, 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 uh, you know, we have gravity on earth. You throw a rock up, it comes down. Right? You throw a rock in the water, it sinks. You go to walk on water, you're going to sink. It's a gravitational pull. So Jesus walking on water doesn't make sense. How many intellectual people you talk to about Jesus, their intellect gets in the way? I could tell you for years, Joe's, my friend Joe's intellect got in the way. See? They can't believe that Jesus walked on water. But I can tell you, and this is the truth. I walked on water. I really did. How many of you believe me? Oh, thank you, Tom. Tom raised his hand. I, I did. I walked on water. It was ice at the time, but I walked on water. Was it water? I walked on water. It was frozen, but it's still water. <laughs> so the conclusion. The rationalistic method in all of its various forms must be totally rejected. 
You're not going to understand certain things in the Bible. How can that happen? How can he be raised from the dead? That doesn't make sense. He died. How can he be risen from the dead? That doesn't make sense. He died. Nobody's been risen from the dead. I haven't seen it. You haven't seen it. So how do we know it? Well, that's when your rational thinking has to be put aside for a moment and say, I don't know, understand it all, but I know that by faith I believe it because God said it. And he's not a man that he should lie. Therefore, I believe God's word. And there are some things that make sense. There are some things we have to receive by faith, right? Okay. The fifth method, I hope I can get through this. The literal method, the origin of this method, we call the literal method of interpretation, or the grammatical historical interpretation of scriptures, a big word, a phrase, rather. Grammatical, historical interpretation of scripture. You use a grammar. You use the history. You use theology. All of these things. You use culture. Remember I gave you the example last week about God, as Jesus saying, my sheep know my voice. What does that mean? And I sh showed you about all the shepherds coming together and all the sheep being together. But when the shepherd spoke, all of the sheep lifted their heads and they, they saw their, the shepherd moving out, their, their pastor, if you will, moving out. All the sheep would turn and follow that shepherd. So when you were talking to the, to the disciples and he said, my sheep know my voice, he knew, they knew, the, they knew the, the, uh, the parallel uh, metaphorical use of the word sheep. We're not sheep. You smell? I don't smell. Sheep stink. They do. Sheep are stupid. Okay, a sheep will go walking right into a river and, and, and because of all the will, Go right to the bottom and, and die, drown. Because they're stupid. So he's using it as a metaphorical example. He says, my sheep hear my voice. So when a shepherd knew that, he saw it. What was he trying to, what was he trying to convey? When he, when he said, my sheep know my voice, what was he trying to convey? Instant obedience. The sheep didn't go, hmm, should I follow? Ah, maybe not, I won't go today. No. When the shepherd spoke and he walked away, okay, he led his sheep. And the sheep followed. And that's what it means. So the literal method the, um, is really the oldest in existence. And it has uh, been assigned to or it's been equated to um, Ezra, the father of hermeneutics. It's traced, uh, we'll trace some of that back in chapter 4 as we go through the um, Palestinian Jews, Christ and the Apostles, the school of Antioch, the Reformers, to the fundamentalist uh, conservatives of our own present day. But the definition, the literal method assumes that the words of Scripture in their plain evident meaning are reliable, that God intended his revelation to be, number one, understood by all who believe. That the words of Scripture communicate what God wants man to know, and that God based the communication of truth on the regular laws governing written communication, thereby intending for it to be interpreted by those same laws. That is not to deny the Holy Spirit's involvement in both the production and the interpretation of the Bible. God uses the same method of interpreting the Bible. The words, as I said, the verbs, the adjectives, the nouns, the pronouns, all of those things, God uses that in a sentence form, in a paragraph form, for you and I to understand. He wants you to understand the Bible. Do you understand that? God, you know, like people used to say, I don't know what God's will is. I'm trying to find God's will. Okay. So he said, but I can't find God's will. I don't know what God's will is. I said, well, let me ask you a question. 
I said, do you think that God is dangling his will out there like a carrot in front of a horse? You know, trying, and every time they go to get it, you move it. No, God's not playing jokes on people. God wants you to know his will. How do we find God's will? Yes. His word is his will. His will is his word. I was discussing this with a brother uh, on the telephone uh, a while back. And uh, he was trying to, I understand what he's trying to do, but he's trying to be spiritual. Okay. And I was telling him, I said, well, the Bible is very plain. If the Bible gives you a command to do something, then you do it, right? And we were talking about giving. We were talking about helping. And the example that I gave was, if you see a brother has a need, let's say you see a brother, he needs food, he, or he needs money to buy food. He needs $25, $30, whatever, $50, $100, doesn't matter what the amount is. I said, the Bible's very plain. It says, if you see a brother in need, right, and it's in your power to meet that need, do it. Right? That's what the word says. Let me ask you a question. Do I got to pray about it? Do I got to fast? Do I got to find out what God's will is? Well, see, he was arguing that he would. He would, he would pray, he says, because the Bible says, Pray without ceasing. And everything, pray. I said, no, that's not, you're taking it out of context. I said, this is an objective commandment of God. I said, the real issue, is, the real issue isn't to pray and be spiritual about it. The real, the real issue is that it's going to cost you something, and you don't want to let it go. I said, that's the real issue. That's the battle you're fighting. It's because I says, number one, it, it tells you. If you see a brother in need, it's in your power to meet the need. Do it. Right? I mean, that's pretty direct. Okay? But see, when you spiritualize it, well, you know, I've got to really pray about it, you know. I've got to pray. Because maybe the Lord will only have me give him $10. I said, that's not what it says. If you see a brother in need, it doesn't say meet the quarter of the need, a half of the need, a third of the need. It says if you see a brother in need and it's in your power, in other words, you have the power, you have it to meet that need. He needs a coat for the winter. You have two coats. i never seen a person wear two coats at the same time. Okay. And you, it's in your power to meet the need. You're going to go pray about it and ask God? whether to give that brother a coat so he can be warm in the winter? No. It's God's will because it's God's word. That was my point I was trying to get across to him. That's God's will. It's God's word. No, no, I don't believe that. I've got to pray about it and you know, make sure the Lord, that's the Lord. And Okay. I said, that ain't going anywhere. See, people want to, they don't want to listen. They don't, they're unteachable in some things. Yes. Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, again, God's not expecting you to buy a house for somebody. It's not in your power to do that. You don't have the ability to do that. Okay. Well, whatever you find to do, do all to the glory of God. I mean, it's very simple. I, but, but see, some people say they believe this is the literal word of God. Some people don't act like they don't believe it. Because if, if this is true... And it is, okay, 
And it says, if you see a brother in need and you have the power to meet that need, then do it. Do it. And so that's what we have to do. We have to do it. There's no arguing about that. Amen? I remember one time, uh, a church we belonged to, it was a, a young man and his son. And I had worked all week. And back then, I was making like $275 a week. That was a lot of money back in the, I guess, middle 80s. And he came, and I was an elder in the church at the time. And... um he was going to get kicked out of his apartment. I just got my check. And the Holy Ghost said, give me a check. I worked all week for that check. Give him your check. So I said, well, I got to talk to somebody first. I talked to my wife. So I told Linda, I said, God wants me to give my check to that young man. I think she agreed right away, too. I don't think he gave me a hard time. She said, okay. She was good. She said, but I'm taking over the books. She said, because you'll give everything away. Now see, what I'm teaching you is not something just from a book. I've done it. I've done it. Did it hurt? Oh, yeah. Was it a sacrifice? Oh, yeah. But look how God's blessed us. I cannot ever say God has never asked me to give up something that he hasn't replaced it or giving me something equal to or even better. He's always, always provided. i never forget the story. I just want to tell you that before I get into this. I won't, I won't tell you that. I want to finish this because I don't want to get into that. But um, Okay. To interpret literally means to explain the original sense of the speaker or writer according to the normal, customary, and proper uses of words and languages. He notes that this method is also called the grammatical historical method because in order to determine the normal and customary usage of Bible language, the accepted rules of grammar and rhetoric must be considered and the historical and cultural aspects of the Bible must be taken into consideration. Now the literal does, sense does not exclude the figurative. There can be figures of speech. Okay. And the literal method does not exclude the spiritual meaning. So you have to be careful. This is what's called hyperliberalism. I'm sorry, hyperliteralism, not liberalism, literalism. Can you put up Isaiah 53:1? Who hath believed our report? How many of us read that scripture before? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Okay. If you take this literally, you would say that God has an arm. Right? Or in Isaiah, another portion of scripture says, The Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. Hyperliteralism says, see, God has an arm, God has a hand. But they're neglecting to read John 4.24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. What did, what did, what did Jesus tell um, Thomas? 
A spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And that's why you've heard me use this big long word. It's called anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. It's a description of bodily parts that are given to God so that we can understand. Let me ask you a question. Does God fill all of eternity? Does he? Right? He fills everywhere. He's everywhere present. He's omnipresent, right? So if he's omnipresent and he has a hand, how big is that hand? What would we see on that hand? Maybe one little line? If he's everywhere present, how, that, that's going to be a big hand. So when you read these things, and I got rebuked by, <laughs> I got rebuked one time in church. Um, uh, I was an elder in the church, and my pastor, he was reading something from Scripture, and I, and I said, uh, Pastor, that is, that is an anthropomorphic expression, that God has a hand. He doesn't really have a hand, does he? And he said, no. Well, then uh, this other lady raised her hand. Remember her? You remember her, honey? Figurito? Sister Figurito? She stood up and she says, I want to read a scripture. Can I read a scripture, Pastor? Sure. She says, she says, see, the Lord's hand and his eyes are on the spare. And she read these, and she emphasized them because she was sitting right back of me, right? And I put my head down. Oh. <laughs> and then Pastor came out and he says, well, that's not literal. That's, you have to, you know, you have to understand that. Because if we take it literally, if we take it literally, right? Then Psalm 91.4, we have to take literally. Put that up there. So this hyper-literalism, you've got to be careful of. There are sometimes, there are figures of speech. So you've got to know the difference. There's metaphorical expressions. There's hypology. You've got to kind of weigh everything out. He shall cover thee with his feathers. Okay, God's got feathers. And under his wings, thou shalt trust. So does God have wings? Does he have feathers? Are you sure? Because some of you are looking awful perplexed. These are human terminologies that you and I can understand. God is infinite. He is immense. He fills all of heaven and earth. He's so great, so powerful, we cannot comprehend in our brains. I don't care if you're a Harvard graduate. We cannot comprehend who God is in the fullest understanding. We can't. So we use these terminologies for you and I to understand who He is. So the hyper... Literalism, you've got to be very careful of. I'll give you a quick story and I'll close with this. There was a man, and he was going into a, he was going to go to a, a class reunion, and he called the motel to a book a room there for him and his wife. They were in, they're going to a family reunion. And he was told all the motels in this town and the surrounding ones are full this weekend, we are having hog days. So he said he gave up and he made other arrangements, but he, uh, he said he called his mother in Iowa and told her about this, and a few days later his mother heard on the news that a hog convention in another nearby town had been canceled due to a hog disease. And uh, they, moved the, they moved the event to Illinois. So she decided to call the motel and see if there was any rooms that had opened up because of that. And when she told the lady about the hog disease, the lady said, this is a rally for Holly Davidson motorcycle owners. These Holly motorcycles are figuratively called hogs. But they don't get diseases. To <laughs> the failure to realize that a figure of speech was being used led to this confusion. You see how easy it is to be confused? The mother thought, oh, there's a hog convention. 
And I just saw on the news that there's hogs that had disease. And so they moved the, they moved the thing over. So there's got to be room now. Because she took it literally that there were hogs. But it was a motorcycle convention. So there's figures of speech. There's typology. But what's the one thing you must do when you're interpreting scripture? I know the word of God, that's good. That's not what I'm looking for, though. Say it louder, honey. In context? Huh? The intensity, the intendant of the writer, what he intended to write, who he wrote to, at the time he wrote, the literal meaning of the context. Always remember that. If you forget everything else tonight, don't forget that. That you have to go back to the original intention of the, the writer's intent of what he meant. Amen? Okay, we'll stop there. I have more, but I, I, it's already 8.30, and I don't want to keep you because I see some people yawning, some people falling asleep, their eyeballs are getting droopy. I don't want to go too long. Thank God you're not in Brother Cootie's Bible study. We were there for three hours. Amen. Any questions? I want to say good night to those on Facebook. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Anyone, else? Anyone have a question?